It still amazes me that preachers and teachers still misunderstand this. One of the most important passages people make mistakes on is John 3. Jesus is speaking about something very important. It's the heart of the entire matter of the book of the Bible, all of it. And yet still people still misunderstand it. So let's go to it real briefly and then let's give a background story to see what Jesus is trying to convey. And I think you're going to see how easy and how obvious it is what God is trying to convey to us. So in John 3, here we see verse 1, Nicodemus, the Pharisee, comes to Jesus and he says, This man came to Jesus, verse 2, by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you come from God uh, as a teacher. Now, who's the we? Obviously, he and the other Pharisees indicating that they know full well that he is of God, that his power comes from God, that he is and eventually going to even realize that he is God. He tells Jesus that we know that because no one can do these signs unless God is with him. And so Jesus says, truly, truly, I said to you that unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, it seems odd that Jesus would take what he says and then turn around and make this statement as though the two don't really go together, but they do because Jesus is trying to make the greater point, understanding or trying to get him to understand why he actually does the things that he does. And so what people kind of mess up on is this understanding of what it means to be born again. It does not mean to be saved. That is not what Jesus just said. Born again does not mean being saved. However, it is the first step in being saved. Notice how he puts the chronology that unless one is born again, he cannot. And so there's a chronology. First, be born again. Secondly, then the person can enter or see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus is thoroughly confused. Nicodemus is thinking that Jesus is saying that you have to be born a second time. Notice what he says. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter into a second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus says, no, that's not what I'm talking about. He says, verse five, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And herein lies the problem because there are those that are just completely missing, not just the theme of what's being spoken of and why Jesus is actually saying this, but really, literally the theme of the entire Bible. Guys, this is vitally important that we get this. This is not a new concept that Jesus is introducing. This is not the first time that this has been spoken of or heard of in the Bible. We may have forgotten about it or overlooked it or just didn't pay attention to it, what have you, but this needs to be dealt with. Jesus is not, let me say what he, again, as clear as I can, he is not speaking about water baptism. That is not in play here. The concept of it is not being talked about here. That's not his point anywhere in this chapter, nor is he speaking of being born of a woman. Some mistake that this being born of water refers to being born of or through the, the embiotic fluids of a woman. No, that is not what's at play here either. That's not even brought up. He says, unless one is born of water and spirit, this is what we call ep exegetical in the Greek, where we separate two words uh, from a chi or the an, mean that they're stating the same thing. It's really two ways of saying the same thing. And so a person is born of water and the spirit. You must be born of water and the spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. Well, he just called it before that. He called that being born again. So being born again is the same as being born of water and spirit. And Jesus is going to get on Nicodemus, so to speak, because Nicodemus should know these things. Now, Jesus calls this being born again, being born of water and the spirit, and being born of the spirit. We're going to come back to this again, but notice what he says to Nicodemus. He says to him in verse uh, 10, he says, Jesus answered him and said, are you a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Therein lies a problem. And the truth be told, those who uh, want to teach the Bible, be a pastor, teacher, preacher, what have you, and don't get this, you are failing in a fundamental understanding of the scriptures. Why is that? Because this issue that Jesus is talking about is an old issue. This is an issue that's being that's been, that's been plaguing man from the very beginning. After the fall, the Bible tells us something about the heart, and this is what Jesus is getting to. He said, the Bible tells us in, in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick, or some verses may say desperately wicked. So what's the problem with mankind? The heart, be it a Jew, be it a Gentile, whoever it is, young, old, wealthy, poor, male, female, our heart is the issue. How do we know? So, well, in Deuteronomy 10, 16, before they're getting ready to go into the land, God has already told them that they're going to be taken out of the land because of their sin, their hard heartedness, their stiff neck. It's going to cause them to be taken out of the land and be brought back. But God tells them in Deuteronomy 10, 16, he says, so circumcise your heart 
and stiffen your neck no longer. So God tells them to circumcise their heart. But we've got a problem. They don't. They can't. Or at least they can't do so consistently. Their heart is the issue. The heart is the problem. Above all else, it is wicked, desperately sick, as we're told. So what is God's remedy? God states that in Deuteronomy 30, not even after the book is written, before the book can be written, God comes back and tells them through, through Moses, moreover, the Lord your God, verse 6 of, of chapter 30, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. Why? Here's the reason why. To do what? To love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Where have we heard that before if we're just reading the New Testament? Well, the question was asked of Jesus, what's the greatest command? He says that you would love your God, the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Now, by the way, the word for heart in the Greek, as well as the Hebrew, labab or lev, or in the Greek cardia, it's not necessarily referring to, and it can also refer to the actual heart organ. It can. But in many cases, especially in this case, it's speaking of the mind, the whole the whole internal process that you go through, just who you are, your, your being. So it refers to, we call it the heart, but it's just kind of you, right? And so you should love him with all of you, with your heart. And so we'll go ahead and use heart because that's the issue with mankind. We've got a bad heart and our heart wants to do what it wants to do. Our heart wants to serve our needs. And when we get in trouble, our heart calls out to God to fix the trouble just so we can go back and do what we want to do. But that's the issue. So God says that I will circumcise your heart. I'm asking you to do it, but you're not going to be able to do it. And so God says that what he's going to do is in the future, he is going to circumcise their heart. And he even tells the reason why. Now, though we're speaking of just Israel, we're going to find out that it's not just Israel whose heart uh, he is going to deal with. And so he brings this up also in Ezekiel 11, chapter 19. He says, and I will give them one heart, this is speaking of Israel, and put a new spirit within them. And I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk. Why is, it, why is this going to happen? He's stating that they or so that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and to do them. Then they will be my people and I shall be their God. So what is he doing this for? to keep them to be obedient, to walk after him, to obey him, to keep his ordinances and statutes. That's the problem. That was a problem from the beginning. That was a problem then. And that is the problem now, be it Jew or Gentile. We'll deal with the Gentile portion in a second because yes, he is speaking to, to the Jews in Israel, but it, it's going to apply to more than just them. Notice what he also says in later on in Ezekiel 36. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Now, by the way, in John 3, we see the two elements, water and spirit. What are we going to see here in Ezekiel? And throughout the Old Testament, we're going to see the same two elements show up, water and spirit. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Is he speaking about actual physical water? No, he's not. He's not going to put physical water on them in their heart, but he's speaking of what? The Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit oftentimes will be identified as water, synonymous with water. How do we know so? In John 4, he speaks to the woman at the well about this wellspring of living water coming up in you. And so the same thing is, is iterated first here in the Old Testament. Here he says, I will sprinkle you with clean water and you will be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put my and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And so what is he saying? He's using these two elements that we see in John 3 water and spirit because they are synonymous they are they're used ep exegetically in john 3 where does that come from in is i mean in ezekiel verse 27 i will put my spirit within you and do what cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances which is what he stated in deuteronomy which is what he stated earlier in an earlier part of ezekiel so this is god stating what he is going to do as a matter of fact that's not the only place that he states that as well in Jeremiah 31, we have the promise of the new covenant to Israel. Notice what he says. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Look what he says. I will put my law within them and on their heart, 
I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So he's reiterating this to them again. He is telling them that they are going to, he's going to put his spirit in them and I will be their God, he says to them, and they will be my people. And they won't have, there won't be any more concern about them walking after him and obeying him. Now he makes this statement, obviously about Israel. The question is, does it refer also to the Gentiles? Well, before we go to discover that it's also inclusive of the Gentiles, let's go back to John 3. This is why he says, you, a teacher of Israel, don't understand these things. Why? What is Jesus's whole point in John 3? Well, John 3 covers the world's most famous passage, John 3.16. What's the issue? So God is going to show his love in this way that he's going to give his only begotten, the only one of his kind, his son, to those who are believing in order that the believing ones in him shall not perish. The issue with the believing ones, how do you become a believing one? And he uses the present active participle, the ing, those that have entered into a state of continual believing, those people shall never perish. How do you get to become a believing one? Well, the heart. Remember in Luke 8, Jesus talks about the parable of the sower and the soils. He states that the seed is the word of God and different people can hear it. He even states that there are those that believe, but then stop believing. But those whose seed fell on good soil, what's the soil? That is the heart, as he explains. They have to receive it with a good heart. Where does the good heart come from? This is what Jesus is talking about in John 3. This is what God was speaking of in Deuteronomy. This is what he was speaking of in Ezekiel, in Jeremiah, in other parts of the Old Testament. The heart needs to be fixed first. To sow good seed on bad soil does no good. And that's the problem. The seed is good. The word of God is good. It's just the soil. And he's asked us to fix our heart, but we cannot. That's why he said in order to first see the kingdom of God, the first thing that's happening is you have to be born from above. The word is getting that they which means to be born from above. You have to be born of the spirit. Is that something that you can do? No, you cannot initiate this. This is of God. How do we know so? He says in verse seven, do not be amazed that I said that you must be born again, Ganethianotham, born from above. And we know it's not being born a second time. So the only other option is to be born from above. Don't be amazed that I said that. Why? Because the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. So it is of everyone who is born of the spirit. So now, just like you don't know where it's coming from, where it's going, so too is those are those who are born of from above. You don't know where it's going to, who it's going to be. That is an act of God. That is not an act that you do. You don't make yourself to be born. You don't cause yourself to be born. We'll deal with that in a second, but this is clearly a work of God. How do we know? Because what was the what were the predecessor verses regarding this? That Jesus says, you, a teacher of Israel, should know this? In Ezekiel, in Jeremiah, in Deuteronomy, all these other passages in the Old Testament that a teacher of Israel should know. Even more so that a teacher of the Bible today that has the entire word of God on display that you should know also. And so if you're teaching this and you don't know this, you need to know this. Do not teach people this whole process of being born again without understanding this. This passage didn't just pop up out of thin air. There's a reason why Jesus rebukes Nicodemus for not knowing this. He's a teacher of Israel. You're supposed to know this. How? Because it was already written. And so any teacher should know this. Now, he makes a statement uh, at the latter part of verse 8. He says, so it is of everyone who is born of the Spirit. And this word for everyone, so it is, um, pas ha gegenemonas, those who are have been born. So pas, all the, all the ones that have been born of ectus, uh, pneumatos, ex who have been born out of or from or of the spirit. So everyone, so it is of everyone who is born of the spirit. The pas includes who? Is it just the Jews or does it include Jews and Gentiles? Well, it, it includes everyone who is born, which is why it makes a statement, everyone. In chapter one, verse 12, he says, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right uh, to become children of God, even to those, even to those who believe, and this is the, those who are believing, this is a uh, present active participle, I'm sorry, this is a present, yeah, present active participle, so these are those who are believing in his name. Look what he says, who were born not of the blood of, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, 
nor of the will of man, but of God. Now this, but of God, I want you to notice how it's written over here. Al ekfeu uh, which is, but of God, they were born. So you were born of God. The will of God is how you were born, not of yourself. You did not cause yourself to be born again. God does so. Peter states so in 1 Peter 1, 3, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. He has caused us to be born again. And it's made of those two words. That's made of two words, Anna and then Genomai. The Genomai we've been seeing before, the Genothe, uh, that's to be born. But the Anna is up from above. So being born above or again, so it's up borning again. It's kind of a rough way of putting it, but so that you can kind of understand what's being said. So this Anna, um, Genesas, which is to be born again. God caused us to be born again. This is why this is why Paul makes a statement in Titus 3, 5. He says he saved us, not on the basis of what we did. You didn't do it. He did it, which we have, which we have done in righteousness. He didn't save us based on that, but according to his mercy. How so? By the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. This word regeneration is two words, palen genesis, genesis, which is genesis is come from this, the, the same word, which is genomai, to be born, and then palen again. So by us being born again. So this word regeneration refers to being born again. And we've been told that God is the one that caused it. Why is that important? Why is this of, of utmost importance? Because our salvation is is predicated on that. Your heart is the issue. You can't fix it. Try as you might, try as you hope to. You, matter of fact, even if you hope to, after a while, you'll stop, you'll stop hoping for your heart to be changed. But it's God who does that work in you first to give you the ability to continuously believe. That's why he refers to us as the believing ones. And now John 3.16 makes even more sense. He died in order that the believing ones in him would never, ever, ever perish. And that, my friends, is the beauty and the importance of that passage, that entire passage um, or a string of passages in John 3 to know that one is God that's done this work. You have this confidence that you will never, ever, ever perish because you are believing in him. And what causes you to be the believing? God's work in you. Amen. Amen.